Distribution okay. provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash this weekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Turnstone. More than furniture, we're an experience. Go to myturnstone.com slash twist to learn more and receive 10% off your first order. And buy the Resumator. Try the Resumator, the hiring solution used by today's fastest growing startups. Start a free trial at theresumator.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. This is This Week in Startups, our news roundtable edition, where we talk about what's in the news in the world of startups, technology, and on the program, Mike Isaac from All Things Digital, allthingsd.com, and the D Conference, as well as Henry Blodgett, the founder and editor-in-chief of Business Insider, which also made some big news this week. We've got a lot to discuss. It's going to be an amazing episode. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, Sid. Money is the root of all evil. Hey everybody, hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups, the show, oh look at that nice new graphic. Love it. Um, but just take out Mahalo because I'm sunsetting that brand and put in inside.com coming September 1st. Um, this is This Week in Startups, the show about startups, technology, making a dent in the universe, making things that matter. If you're interested in being an entrepreneur, if you're interested in understanding what is going on in the technology industry, you are in the right place. If you're interested in anything else, just click on one of those videos to the right on YouTube. Uh, this is our News Roundtable Edition. And the News Roundtable Edition is pretty simple. We take the top 10, 20 stories of the week, and we talk about them with our roundtable of brilliant folks. And those brilliant folks are Henry Blodgett from Business Insider and Mike Isaac from All Things D, who I'll intro in just a moment. Uh, a couple of orders of housekeeping um, on March I'm sorry, June 26th and 27th, we'll be having the second annual Launch Education and Kids Conference brought to you by Pearson and School Messenger. Thanks to those guys for the support. It's taking place at Microsoft's campus, and they gave us the space for free. Thanks a lot to my friends at Microsoft, who gave me an open invitation to host an event at any one of their locations at any time I want. That's pretty big. When do they do that? Yeah, it's over lunch. They're like, listen, we love what you do. Anytime you want, any location, any time, you can oh, have no. it for free. We'll buy the cookies. That's don't buy nice. the cookies. It's kind of nice. You know, like when I was a kid growing up, I had a PC Junior. I just tweeted this yeah. to Bill Gates and Paul Allen this morning. Like, hey, guys, like, you know, I was really inspired by you guys yeah. in 1983. I got the PC Junior. And now it's like, really, I'm 42, and I, it's 20 years later, 30 years later, and I can actually host an event at Microsoft anytime I want. It's a big vote of confidence. I really appreciate that, cool. guys. Um, hey, the Resumator, the Resumator. I use this product all the time. Uh, and this is one of the things I'm very lucky about. The program, This Week in Startups, is now four years old. And uh, 100,000 people download every episode, yada, yada, yada. But the best part is we're able to uh, have a team of people working on the show thanks to partners like The Resumator, who's uh, sponsoring the program today for the first time. But The Resumator is an interesting story. As we know, yeah, the founder was. called into the show for an Ask Jason three or four years ago. Don did, yes. Don did. And then he was a, a great guest on the program. He was an amazing guest. Was he Philly or Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Come yes. on, man. I yeah, Whatever. It's like it's, I know the city's named with a P, and it's below New York. <laughs> that's, that's as far as I go. It's... West of New York. It, it's sort of somewhere between New York and Florida, right? No, anyway, West. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> the Resumator <laughs> is an amazing company. I use it. It's like software as a service for, I can explain without even looking at the copy. You basically, instead of putting your email address and getting flooded with resumes, you put the URL of your Resumator site, your software as a service site. You pay like, I don't know, 100 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month. It's really affordable. And I've been paying for it for like three or four years now. Yep. And then all the resumes come in, and you can ask questions before they actually submit their resume, and then it normalizes it. It puts it into a workflow system, and then you can tell your people, like, hey, sort through the resumes and say, are they a candidate or not? Then, if they're a candidate, then if workflow goes to the next person, they review them, normalizes all the questions, puts in your notes, and you basically take things out of Excel or Dropbox out of folders, your email. At, and certainly out of your email, and put it all in one place. And here you go. Here's the resume I've been using for years. We have almost 18,000 people have applied to positions at my companies because I use it for three or four different companies. And um, it just works brilliantly. Like, you know, I don't want to show any of the resumes in there because then you'll see you know, people applying for jobs, and that would be a uh, privacy thing. But anyway, it works brilliantly. Screen resumes based on job criteria, track the applicants, hire employees efficiently, stay connect, competitive by roosting time and cost per hire. You have to use the product. It's absolutely great. I use it for everything. Um, and for a free trial, oh, a free trial, awesome. 
go to theresumator.com slash twist and go ahead and thank The Resumator on your Twitter account. Thank you, Resumator. Hey, on the program today, Mike Isaac from All Things D. Welcome to the program for the first time, Mike. Thanks for having me. A pleasure, a pleasure. And what, what, uh, explain to the audience what your beat is at uh, All Things D, please. Yeah, yeah. So I am the social reporter. I basically spend all my time thinking about Facebook and Twitter and then all the little social startups in the ecosystem in the Silicon Valley. Great. And, of course, we're going to talk about Facebook's uh, Android home. home screen talking heads thing, right? Yep. Yeah, the super phone. If, there, if anyone will actually buy the thing. Yeah, exactly. And welcome back to the program, my good friend of almost two decades, Henry Blodgett. Hello, thank you for having me. It's going to be a great week, and boy, you're just, look at that I smile. I can't believe you're only 42. You are, you're just a young pup. I, you know oh what? We God. were kids when I'm we started. I'm shocked how, to hear that. How old are you, Henry? You it, were a kid. How old are you? I was middle-aged, apparently. How I'm old 47. You're 47, so I'm right behind you. Um, but hey, you're walking on uh, eggshells right now. I can see that big, huge smile from 2,000 miles away. <laughs> Jeff Bezos gave you $5 million. That is the biggest vote of confidence you could ever get, is it not? It, well, it didn't all come from him, but he was great. And it's, 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 yes, it's a vote of confidence, but it's, you know, Jeff Bezos is somebody that I've actually admired for two decades. I mean, the way he leads Amazon, what they've done at that company is just tremendously inspiring and very different in a lot of ways than, than a lot of American corporations are run. So I have been a huge fan of his from afar. So yes, I was very stoked when he said, you know, I'd be interested in investing. I was like, great, when can we get it done? <laughs> so how to, explain to me exactly how that gets done. Obviously, you know him. So you had lunch with him at some point at some event. And, and from what I understand, and then all of a sudden you get this email out of the blue. Yeah, we, we had dinner. We talked about a lot of things. I mean, we go way back, as you, you know, people talk about the target that I had on Amazon in the late 1990s and covering the company and, and so forth. So we just had dinner. We talked about a lot of things. And then a few months later, he said he was interested in investing. And he's got a, a great team at his investment firm that makes lots of different investments. I mean, the guy invests in just incredibly cool stuff, the atomic clock, rockets, different things like that. And so his team handled it, but we went from there. It's a um, it's a major thing to have him as an investor, and uh, he, he actually was going to invest in Weblogs Inc. back in the day. I think pound for pound right now, it's him and Elon Musk the, and Larry Page. Those are the three best CEOs right now. I put Zuckerberg far behind those three. What do you think, Henry? Well, I, I mean, I think Jeff, absolutely. I, I mean, I, and, and to me, the, the best, the most impressive attribute that he has, a lot of people have vision, a lot of people have great ideas, a lot of people are incredibly smart. Very few people have as long-term a commitment and vision as he does, and he had it right from the beginning. And another thing that he does that is so helpful for companies is he will take a huge amount of flack over the near term, and he will have his stock price beat up, and he will have people talk about how the company can't make money and all these other things, everybody carping about how his low his margins are, while he is investing for the long term. And, and that's part and parcel of why Amazon has been so successful, because he can resist that short-term pressure and ridicule and, and so forth, single-mindedly focused on Amazon's customers. And, and that's something that I think that every entrepreneur should look at and say, that's what I want to hold myself to, to do. And I, and I think Mark Zuckerberg has certainly done that. Elon Musk is tremendously impressive as well. I mean, the, the amount that guy has created in his life, staggering. Okay, so um, let's, do our, let's, do our fan, let's do our Fantastic Four right now. Isaac? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll ask you, Elon Musk versus Mark Zuckerberg. Five, four, three, two, go. Zuckerberg. What? <laughs> you didn't exist. <laughs> what did he say? He said Zuckerberg. You said Zuckerberg? What? Oh, my God. Wow. I had to say it because I knew, I knew someone else was going to say Elon. I knew, I knew, no, I knew, see, I he, he's a social oh. reporter. That was bad. Okay, we'll do the next one here then. Z right. Okay, here we go. Henry Blodgett. Zuckerberg or Larry Page? Five, four, three, mm -hmm. two. What? They're both great. Why are we picking one? What is well, this? It, like it's a, a, it's an match? editorial oh. device, Henry. It's an editorial oh, device. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I, I, I Play along. That. These are four great CEOs with different Larry styles, Page. But the one thing they have in common all right. is this long-term focus and tremendous boldness. <laughs> They've all got that. One, you have $1 million, Henry. You have to invest it in either Larry Page or Mark Zuckerberg. Three, two, go. 
Fifty-fifty. Five hundred each. He won't you know, do this it. This is the problem with Henry Blodger today. He's so damn <laughs> successful, he's afraid to take an editorial stand. I think it's over for you, I Henry. Thought we were, I it's thought over we were for betting you. on who would win in a wrestling match. So that's why I went with Zuckerberg. You, you picked Zuckerberg or Elon Musk? You've obviously <laughs> never met either man. <laughs> I think Elon Musk would like, just take Zuckerberg and be like, Pfft. I mean, that's like taking a super. All right, listen. Obviously, I'm falling flat with this contest. Um, <laughs> let's do the Facebook yeah. Android release. Then we'll do the Arrington story. Um, and then we'll do commercial. All right. Let's start so, with the so we know the big reveal yesterday. A lot of it had already been leaked, and a lot mm -hmm. of it seems to have been fairly accurate about the Facebook Home. It's a new skin app for Android. They have this thing called the cover feed, the chat heads, so you'll be able to chat with your friends no matter where you are in the phone. You don't have to go into a separate app. The mm -hmm. cover feed gives you all the updates, what's happening with your friends without you having to actually unlock the phone first. Yep. Yep. Um, now, the Facebook phone, which we've heard about over the years, finally has emerged in the form of this HTC First, which is you know, coming preloaded with Facebook Home. It's going to be $99 um, and beautiful colors and all those sorts of things. Now, you will be able to get the Facebook Home on your Android, select Android device starting April 12th. And, uh, you know, Zuckerberg, of course, um, you thought had done quite a job product-wise with this particular uh, uh, best product. product. Best product uh, announcement ever. Right. So, from, But then from, from my questions are, well, who's going to buy the phone, and are you as concerned as O'Malik is about the privacy issues here? Well, let's ask the expert. Isaac, what do you think? You agree with me? Best product uh, announcement ever from Zuckerberg? Best product announcement? Is that what you said? Yeah. For my, for, that's my opinion. Do you agree? I mean, I wasn't underwhelmed. I, I think the, the sort of shining points were the cover feed, just in terms of the company, and the, the constant flow of content coming through at all times. Uh, so obviously, that's like, you know, that's where they insert ads in the future. That's where Zuckerberg said he's going to insert ads. And this sort of persistent Facebook is all up in your phone all the time. You can't just sort of like relegate it to an app anymore. Is a uh, is a win or is a good thing for Facebook? Now I, I I just don't know, I don't know who like the target market is. I don't know if it's like teenagers that are like obsessed with Facebook, which I don't know if those still exist or not anymore, or you know like you know grown adults that are still using it. I'm I'm waiting for them to release an ad subsidized model that is essentially like free, right? So they they, they introduce ads into the cover feed and they can start giving away with them. For yeah, well this is something, that's a really good point, Isaac. I think absolutely if they did, every time you turn on your phone, you watch a 15 second pre-roll. I said this about YouTube should release a $99 or a $49 tablet that every time you turn it on, you watch a Google ad you know, a true view ad that then goes into whatever the top video of the day is or something. Right. Pick your ad, pick your video. And you just, you have to watch one ad a day. And if that's worth 10, 20 cents, you know, you, you start talking about some serious change after two years. Uh, Henry, what do you think of uh, the announcement from Facebook? I thought it was a very cool product. I mean, they did, they definitely did some things that look really sexy. There's a lot of good functionality and, and so forth. I, and I was talking to David Kirkpatrick, actually, on our Yahoo show this morning, and he's saying, look, you know, don't compare this to the U.S. This is all about India. It's all about China. This is where people really want this, and, and it's going to take off. Uh, and I guess that's possible. I mean, I guess there are a lot of people who might, in fact, want their phone turned into a Facebook communicator. I would hate it. It's already everything is just a tiny poke or swipe away from whatever I want. I like the app interface now. I don't need to be assaulted any more than I already am by pictures or what have you. And, and I think Facebook knows that. And I think that's why you're seeing them launch on mid-range phones. At this point, yep. though, uh, to me, this is, is, is a souped up inter Android app, is what it is. The reason it is not on iOS is because I'm sure Apple would laugh out of the room, saying, you've got to be kidding me. We're not going to give away that real estate. It'll be very interesting to see whether Google tries to restrict this going forward, because effectively, Facebook has now put itself between both the hardware provider and the operating system provider and the customer. And this is all about owning the customer and value. This is a very bold move. And if, it, if this really becomes the thing, I think a lot of the operating system guys are going to be disrupted. That is a very astute point. I mean, I cannot believe the um, level of interception going on now. There really is a trend now of infect the other guy's ecosystem. Oh, Google's doing it with Apple. Right, and Google's the perfect example doing with Apple. Like infect the, their ecosystem mm -hmm. at 
And this is a really aggressive step. I'm going to take your home screen away. You yep. can be sure in the next version of Android, they're going to say, you're not allowed to take the home screen away. You're not allowed to take off the you know, which they, which they obviously didn't do because every phone, like Samsung, everybody's got a different home screen. Right. So I don't know. They're going to have to. But I, I, I really did like the also, I thought it was the most original thing I've seen Facebook do ever. Because Facebook's never done anything, yep. right? They always just steal stuff, right? Snapchat was just a total pixel for pixel rip off of Poke. Or Poke was Snapchat, yeah, right. rather. Sorry, the other way around. And this just seemed like wholly original. Like, well, we're going to do... They took their time. We're gonna, but they did seem to be stealing a little bit from Path. Like yes, the little Dave circular Warren. faces was mm -hmm. a, a, a clear hat tip to yep. Path's design. So yep. I felt there was a little rip off of Path there. Um, what do you think of the chat heads, Isaac? And what do you think of the ripping off of Path? Yeah, so I, I think that essentially what you're saying is, is, is pretty right in terms of coming up with something like original. They, they, I think that they were very smart to take uh, the sort of things that are hot right now. So like obviously messaging apps are like exploding. There's like WhatsApp, which has like tens yep. of millions of users. Uh, message me. Snapchat, things like that. Message me exactly, which just launched. So they're not doing direct ripoffs and like straight up going head to head like they did with Poke, which totally flopped. But they are sort of synthesizing different elements into you know, into a greater whole, right? So if someone's like, oh, this is a cool feature that wouldn't just be uh, something I would use in a standalone app, but rather part of a, an entire, you know, uh, system, then, you know, maybe that's more of a compelling argument than say, download Poke and you can do exactly what Snapchat, Snapchat did, you know? Well, I, I think this is a watershed moment for Facebook. I think it's really wholly original. Um, even mm -hmm. though it's got some inspiration. I feel like this is like, they're finally starting to do original things. I still think Zuckerberg is the worst presenter ever. Like, he doesn't <laughs> understand the timing of when people clap. He's like, and so, here is chat heads. Here is chat heads. <laughs> he, and it was he like... He's gotten so much better. He has gotten so much better <laughs> over the years, though. Like, before he, he... Now he actually has, like, emotion. Before he was, like, affectless. Yeah. Now at least he can sort of, like, say, I'm excited about this. Right. What did you think of his performance, Henry? I mean, I don't mean to uh, mi minimize it, but it, it is, he's still kind of awkward, huh? I, I didn't watch him live, but I, I think I have to agree with Mike. I mean, Mark's gotten so much better. Yeah. And the first big public appearance that he had after the IPO where just everybody was dumping on him and on the stock and everything else, and that's when he went out and I think it was the TechCrunch disrupt. Uh, and he was excellent. He was funny. He was self-deprecating, and and he presented very well. And he instilled a lot of confidence. And you saw the stock take off immediately on that. So I, I don't think people have any problem with sort of awkwardness. And I think you saying it, dude, you are a great presenter. So of course oh. you're going to have problems with everybody <laughs> else. I, th I think I think people like you know Mark is Mark. Everyone knows it's kind of awkward, but kind of funny and endearing at the same time. So yeah. I agree with Mike. I think he's done a tremendous. He's improved tremendously. So are you long the stock? You think Henry? I mean, do you think the stock price is actually do you think they're going to have massive growth? Or do you just think this is going to be a sideways company for a couple more years? I think it's going to be sideways, and sideways meaning very volatile, up and down, as people get excited about different things. It, to me, the big issue is is they went public very late. They were a very mature company. They already had a 50% operating margin. Their revenue growth was starting to decelerate rapidly, and they were making this big transition from desktop to mobile. Normally, when, a, when that starts to happen, a stock that has been a momentum stock that has done nothing but go through the roof, it breaks down. You have many years where the valuation starts to compress. You have different shareholders take over. And then eventually, it settles in and becomes a long-term growth story at a much lower valuation in terms of a, a multiple and much different investors and so forth. And I think they're in that period. You know, that said, and if you look at it, they're, they're trading about 45 times earnings. You look at Google is about 17, Apple is at about 10. They're just valued incredibly highly relative to a lot of other uh, mature companies. So yes, there's always a chance that they pull a rabbit out of a hat, some huge new product that they roll out to a billion people on the stock goes to the moon. But I, I think more likely we're just in this long-term consolidation period. Is there any chance that this is a breakout started. product like you're explaining, like a break? This is not the breakout product. I don't think on the revenue side it is. I mean, I don't, yes, there has certainly already been talk about how they're going to put advertisements there. And, you know, maybe there is a species of human being somewhere on the planet that doesn't mind having huge advertisements blasted at the home screen <laughs> of their um, <laughs> smartphone. But it's certainly nobody I know. I mean, it's already 
really intrusive smartphone advertising is a different kind of assault. Let me than ask you this, Henry. And Henry, so I think they would have a problem with that. If Henry, if your iPhone five, which you love, right? You're addicted. If I am. you were able to have that phone for free, no purchase price, right? Would you accept a home screen that had content, ad, content, content, ad? No, I would not, but I should caveat that by saying in the United States, we have these wonderful subsidies that trick us into thinking the iPhone is only $199. I only buy yeah. one every two or three years. In terms of a cost per minute of use, that is one of the lowest cost and best spent $200 that I could spend anywhere. I mean, I'm, the thing is a part of my anatomy by now. Um, I use it so much. So that would that trade-off would absolutely not be worth it for me. Um, and I think that there are many other options where we were certainly in the United States, we can get free phones. That said, the explosive growth for internet, new internet users and smartphones right now is in emerging markets like China and India and Brazil. And there, $200 and $600 for a full iPhone is it just a crap load of money. And so there, it may absolutely make Isaac, sense. Isaac, what do you think, be Isaac? Better, um, better model. Isaac, do you think content ad, content, content ad would be a great trade-off in those emerging markets? Do you agree with Henry Blodgett? Yeah, I, I actually really do. I think uh, over here, you know, you think of America. So we can actually already get three iPhones. It's an iPhone like four, I believe, for, but you can actually get an iPhone four free at this point uh, in the United States, right? As long as you do the sort of carrier subsidy. But uh, I can totally see this being an emerging market play. This is where they want to grow Android use already in like in terms of messaging applications and things like that. So like, you know, China, obviously India, South America, Middle East. Uh, I agree. I agree with him on this one. All right. Let me take a moment to uh, thank one of our sponsors, and then we get back to the news. Uh, My Terrorstone offers simple and smart furniture solutions for small businesses and startups. I, Jason Galaganis, have uh, a Turnstone desk, and so do my 40 or 50 people upstairs for me right now. I don't have Turnstone on my... Oh, there it is. Oh, my God. Look how gorgeous this is. Uh, pull up my screen. Thank you. Thank you to my friends at uh, My Turnstone. It's affordable. It's, you know, listen, it's a step above, I'll be honest, it's a step above the cheap stuff that you build yourself. I don't want to say anything derogatory about the people from Scandinavia who make really cheap furniture. That seems like a good idea until it breaks. Um, this is like buying something 10 times better, but at only double the cost. If you catch my drift, like yep. this is a very value play. You buy these, you could resell them for 60, 70, 80%, I think, two or three years later. They're incredible. Everybody's sitting on them here at the office. Everybody loves them. They're gorgeous. And I have to say, morale goes up when you have beautiful furniture in a beautiful space. People have to spend 10 hours a day there. It better be gorgeous. Go to myturnstone.com slash twist and get 10% off your first order. That's serious money. Thank you to my friends at Twist. I'm sorry, at My Turnstone for giving my audience, the Twist audience, the This Week in Startups audience, 10% off. But you know, this, it's not like they're giving 10% off software. They're giving 10% off a of physical goods product. Exactly. And so, you saw that uh, one of your fans... Uh, yeah, one of my fans bought a bunch yeah. of stuff. He has it all set up. He said it was yeah. easy to set up. Yeah. You can get an installer. We had an installer because we had so many desks to do. But boy, isn't it beautiful yeah. at the office? It's it gorgeous. is nice. It is nice. Uh, MyTurnstone.com slash twist. This offer is only for you, our loyal twist. Visitors, listeners, etc. Simple and smart just awesome thanks so much and they have all these like cool groovy little like add-ons you can get and like the other little plants and stuff like that like that kind of stuff i'm telling you you put this kind of stuff in an office like people notice that you're taking the time to put that little planter there and whatever and they just feel like they're living in the future and that it's awesome so thank you to my friends at my turnstone everybody follow at my turnstone if you buy it my turn my turnstone desk hey tell you what here's an offer I always try to do a little something extra. If you, if you, uh, let's say, how do I phrase this? If you uh, buy My Turnstone for your office, the first like three people to buy My Turnstone for their office and then send me pictures, I'll take them to lunch. All right. Free hour lunch with J. Cal, but only three. I, I can't go to lunch with 30 people. No, and no. I may put you together for lunch. It's not a one on one lunch. I may bundle the lunch. You may bundle the lunch. I reserve, but I'm paying for the lunch. You're paying? And where are you, where are you taking these people? I'll take them in and out burger. I'll take them <laughs> I was going to say, want. aren't you doing Nobu for these folks? Come no, on. Like, what are you trying to do? Bankrupt me? I'll do, I'll do sushi. I'll do something high end. It'll be like a hundred dollars. Nice. Exactly. hundred dollar person lunch, okay? It'll be Here serious. You Thank you, my turnstone. Okay. Henry Blodge, how do you like that ad read? It's amazing. You've integrated it in. And the other thing I love about this, you use all of your products. It's I won't accept. I won't accept an advertiser if I don't use their product. There we go. It's called whitelisted advertising. 
See, this is what I would bring to the board of Business Insider. These kind of innovations, Henry. <laughs> I gotta get that half. What did you offer me? I gotta find that original email. You offered me what, like two points? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, whatever it was, it wasn't enough. You were I being... think it, no, I just didn't, you know, I felt like as friends, I shouldn't take it from you and I wanted you to, I didn't want you to live in my shadow if you named it Ali Insider. Remember I told you, like, it's better yeah, I not right. be involved because then people are gonna think like it's my idea or whatever. I want you to have your own success and it turned out to be great except for me. That 2%, I'm guessing the valuation was 150 million, Henry? <laughs> He's nice not going to tell you. 100? <laughs> it's a double secret, man. It's I can tell. Okay, up. it's over 100. I got it. I got it. I just got it. I, got, I saw Henry's got an incredible talent. I was going to say, got he it. did let's this. Let's play poker. Heads up soon, Henry. It's, a, it's over 100. Okay, let's do the story that everybody wants to hear about. I don't, and just as a, a precursor to this whole thing, I, I don't really actually want to talk about this story. Um, I have not talked about this for years. I have d divorced myself from this individual, you know, after we had our breakup. I, I, this is not for ratings. I, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because, A, I feel like on an integrity basis, I, not talking about it in the news program when I host a news program would be wrong. Uh, and number two, my name is all over it now. Uh, and I'm, my name is being brought up as knowing information, and I need to clear the air about that. And you'd rather do it in a format like this than in an editorial? I, I just don't want to, if I write something, then people are going to misinterpret it, and I want people to be able to look me in the eyes and hear what I have to say. All right. So do you want to, do you have a recap of what it is? I, I didn't write it down officially, but I can uh If you can recap it without, like, and making, because it's delicate and make it sure. Is, it is very delicate. So, um story came out in Gawker this week. Um, it was based on a Facebook post by a woman named Jen Allen. And in that post, she had said to her friends that, you know, she'd been, you know, really depressed and, you know, she'd finally broken up with this person and, um, you know, had treated her very poorly and um, had even threatened to murder her if she ever told anyone what he had done to her. And she had, you know, a whole lot of comments and, that came out, I believe, on March 28th, and I think the Gawker story came out a couple of days later. I'm not quite sure why there was a delay, but uh, when they did come out with the story, they took a photo of of Mike and Jen together that was taken last year at an event and put, you know, nice little red banner over it. And uh, the article did confirm that they had dated at one point. Uh, the article also pointed out that Mike had included Jen's company in his write-up a few years ago of female-led uh, startups in the Valley, and that, like, that photo, uh, they had been photographed together at an event uh, last year at uh, SOMA, I believe. So um, that article comes out and then basically silence. Nobody else picks it up. There it is. And, you know, you were already asking me that afternoon, you know, we need to point out that all things D, that tech crunch, that venture B, that, you know, any number of tech blogs, they haven't covered the story yet. And I thought, well, maybe they're doing the original reporting and they're yep. trying to verify things. And But really, it has been pretty quiet ever since then. And uh, Since uh, April 1st when the story broke. Right. And then Lauren Feldman um, of 1938 Media, he felt compelled to share what he thought about the situation. He recorded and posted his his video to YouTube uh, yep. the other night and you know you you share that as well and Lauren said you know I know Mike I, t I you know I know I'm not a lawyer I'm not all these things but I think he, he did it Lauren also said Mike's just a guy you shouldn't be afraid of him he doesn't determine your startup success and right. he thought it was terrible that nobody was talking about it and, and he, then today yeah we have the big news drops which is pretty disturbing um, let's see what does it say here in the story? Um, a woman who was the HR person, her name is Cecilia Demet Sharp, the director of human resources at Real Names at the time, says, I believe he threw her onto a bed and he started kicking and he held her down really hard and she felt uncomfortable coming to the office with Arrington there and then there was a cover up and she in good conscience can't say anything. So this is whatever it is, 10 years from then. And then there's this talk of Megan Asha and her being thrown against the wall by Arrington at the end of the TechCrunch 50 conference and me getting a phone call about it. And so I am not commenting on the phone call except to say that there was a phone call because the stuff that was talk that the stuff that was told to me in the phone call I have no way of verifying if it's true or not and I don't feel it's my place if there's another person it's it's hearsay until that original person I guess confirms it I I can't lie that there was not a phone call because there are multiple people saying there was a phone call and I'm not a liar so I'm not going to ever lie and I wouldn't lie to the audience uh, but let's take a look at the media side of this 
Henry Blodgett, you guys have not covered it yet. What is the benchmark for covering a story like this, and how do you look at it, you know, without talking about this case in specific, or, or talking about this case, whatever you're, f f um, whatever you're um, comfortable with, Henry, what, what's your take? Well, so I don't, I mean, yes, we should talk absolutely about this case specifically, which is potentially very serious. I, I think we link to the Gawker story immediately because um, it is an interesting story and it's a very serious allegation. But then the Business Insider linked to it? Yeah, we link to it immediately. And it's very right directly to the story. We do that. We link out to a lot of stories. On Where do you do that? It's all things D and, and so forth. I'm sorry? Where did you do that? On the homepage? Or? Right from our homepage. Homepage of the tech section. And so we link to it. The, my point, or my feeling on this though, is there was immediately a lot of talk about, wait, why aren't our tech folks covering this and that kind of thing. Look, this is a very serious allegation. If it happened yeah. the way it was described, it is a crime. And usually the way these things come out is that there is a lawsuit filed or there is a, a police complaint registered where everything is taken out. And this was very odd the way it came out, frankly. And it, it sounded a little odd. It's a, it's a blog comment and a Facebook post that doesn't mean it's not serious. It does. But then the next step is, OK, what's the full story? Let's get it on the record. And I, I think that Gawker's published another story today that goes back, as you mentioned, into some previous incidents where there is a lot of detail on them. So we're starting to get that. So for me, it's a question of time. And I mean, again, to be fair to everybody involved here, you want to be very careful and right about these things. You don't want to just throw them around. And, and so I would defend the media in saying, look, take your time, do it right. Gawker, again, has done a very detailed story here. Um, and I would encourage people to read it. And, and there are more stories to come on, on this story. You, you are aware of more stuff, and there are a lot of rumors, yes? No, I, I should say I'm not, I don't mean that I'm aware of other things. You, you, know, you may be, and I would love to hear your, your talks on that. I mean, I, I, what I'm saying is there's still one big story here that needs to be fleshed out, which is more from the woman who posted the original Facebook post. Again, to go public like that, you you then want to take the next step and say look spell it out because if it happened the way you described it it's just incredibly serious do you and have so do you have a journalist more. henry on the story pursuing the story i'm not going to talk about what we're doing internally but i'm not i was i was not surprised to see gawker follow up with the story that they followed up with i think that's something that a lot of media organizations would be working on so you don't have a responsibility as one of the publications of record to investigate this henry or are you just not going to say if you are or not? I, I'm not going to talk about what we're doing or what we're not doing. I just think that the immediately progressing from the Gawker story, which, again, is a very serious allegation. Absolutely. It's, well, it's actually allegations of rape now. To immediately piling on and saying the media is not doing their job, they're scared, they're being wimpy, and so forth. I, I would just respectfully suggest that maybe they're in fact being responsible and they want to get it right. And for mm. everybody involved, I, I you know I I think that I can appreciate that. And in the same way that I am not talking about that phone call mm. because I don't want to come out here and start saying hearsay about something that is a felony. Okay. Right, yep. yeah, and and it's very dangerous. Isaac, all things well, D you, only covers stuff. My understanding is all things D will only cover it if legal papers are filed. Correct? I, I I don't think that's necessarily our hard line, but I think that the like basically what Henry said is completely true. Like obviously, we are going to be a whole lot more careful about this sort of thing. You know, it's. it's you know, actual crimes. It's not just like, you know, like he said, she said in terms of like money, you know, and valuation rounds and things like that, right? So this is serious stuff where serious journalists are going to tread carefully. What I think is being conflated, though, is the uh, the sort of media not covering it immediately versus the sort of greater valley population at large not talking about the story at all or not sort of like commenting on the story, uh, period, right? So like even if you don't, uh, even if uh, I, as a journalist, have not uh, come out and, and given a, a story on, based on reported facts, the fact that people aren't sort of retweeting the thing or it's not circulating, at least publicly, is 
uh, I think that's sort of getting carried over to, to well, 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 I guess the media is copying out. Here. Why, why, we do have the media not commenting yet, right, outside of Gawker. I think only Beta Beat has done something. So we have this really, like, nobody has gotten into the story. And now, of course, today is new information. So there could be a lot. I, I'm assuming everybody is investigating this, including the New York Times, including AOL, including Henry Blodgett, including All Things D. Um, I'm, I'm assuming everybody is because it's a serious, serious issue. They would be a big problem if they weren't. Yeah, but they have to be careful. But there is something where nobody will talk about this on Twitter. And I have mixed feelings about talking about Twitter because obviously anything I talk about, people are going to feel this bias because we broke up, you know. And right. now the breakup of myself and Mike at TechCrunch 50 is being linked, linked directly to this phone call on the same mm. day. And so now, you know, that makes mm -hmm. it even more complicated. Mm. And I realize that makes it much more complicated. But, you know, um, I, I can't... Why did you... Can I ask you why you felt compelled to write your... Uh, post on Facebook when when Jim first posted her thing? It's a good question. Um, in the post on Facebook, I don't mention anybody by name. That's I true. talk right. about my experience in misreading a person and the impact okay. it's had on me. And I, um, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a conscience thing right now, I'll be honest. Um, because it's very difficult for me because, you know, I was friends with Mike for three years, four years. I was business partners. That's a very serious thing, obviously, to be in business yes. with somebody. And when I look back on it in hindsight, a lot of my friends said, do not get involved with Mike Arrington. And when I met Mike, he had no full-time employees, maybe two or three people, maybe two employees working out of his house. And he didn't understand the media business. And I feel, I know I made a mistake being in business with him, number one, but... I have learned certain things about media and how to accumulate power in media and how to accumulate status. And mm. I taught him that. And that I regret. You gave him the ability. I taught to him be a lot about is. how to become important. I taught mm -hmm. him how to have power. I taught a guy who abused that power how to have power. And you knew that he was somebody who was capable of abusing power at the time? I didn't know. I, you know, it's very hard to know when somebody goes from being just a jerk to being more than a jerk, you know? And I learned it over time. And, you know, I really learned it. You know, I, I don't know. The whole thing is very hard for me. Can you, can it was also, I'm just sort of curious also, uh, in your post you didn't name Mike specifically. Is that more like a legal maneuvering thing or are you just sort of reticent to... Uh, like you got, like I, I don't want to be dragged into it. You know, I, I really don't. I, you know, I separated from Mike. He's a toxic person. Um, right. We all know that. And now we obviously know a lot more. We, is it possible that this is all made up? You know, that's what I'm asking myself. I don't know the answer to that. And, you know, I don't want to seem like, you know, I'm injecting myself into this story, but I regret ever having a relationship with him. I regret doing the, I love the work we did together. And there was a time I considered him a very good friend, so I really feel like an idiot, you know, that I actually got duped. I don't get duped often. It's very rare, in fact. And, and I built my whole career on being savvy. I, you know, I, I, what I sure. lacked in smarts, like Henry Blodgett is where he is because he's really smart. I'm where I am because I'm really savvy, you know? You're street and, smart. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I, I, Henry Blodgett, if I play him in chess, he's going to kill me. And if I play Henry Blodgett in poker, I'm going to own his house. You know, that, that's the difference between Henry Blodgett and I, not to make light of it. And, and I got duped. And I wrote it because I, I process things by writing. I'm a writer. I didn't, right. think, it be, I, I didn't think it was going to get picked up by Gawker. You know, I, I thought this would be something I would write to my friends on Facebook. That's well, why I didn't publish it as an email. Well, and interesting that you chose Facebook as your outlet. I thought that that would be a place where it would, you know, just live there, you know, and mm -hmm. I think it was going to get blown up. I honestly didn't. Um, I just want to sort of like, like, well, I think, I think it's interesting, Jason, just because like, like, obviously you, you are part of this, but it's interesting to see the tension. Like you, you, you kind of are put, putting yourself in it in terms of like, taking a stance and sort of showing that, yes, I was, I was wrong by this person. You know, it didn't really work out. Uh, uh, I just want to, I'm just wondering, like, is there going to be a threshold where you're going to, where you're going to officially take kind of a stance on everything? Yeah. I mean, listen, I, my stance is he's a bad person. He's a bad actor, right? Right. He stole from me. But at the end of the day, as I told people, when he stole from me and he threatened everybody around me to not be involved with me, to not participate in my conference, 
I, I said to my wife at the time, I will fight through this and I will be victorious in terms of on a business level. People will realize that the TechCrunch 50 conference was me and not him. And that I pu- and then I poured my heart and soul with you at my side, yes. Karen, yep. into the launch festival. And I, you know, I think this year was, you know, uh, it was our s- best event ever. It was the best event ever. I sort of feel like, you know, that. And for me, I don't make any money off the event, although we did make money on TechCrunch 50 together. You know, I, I don't like getting screwed and all that kind of stuff. But I don't, I don't feel like a victim at all. You know, you can't, you sure. can't look at me as any kind of a victim, especially if anything that's being said is even remotely true, which we don't know. And I feel like any, you know, I'm a big personality and I got a little PT Barnum in me. I realize that. And I, I just, I feel like me commenting on all this stuff then actually detracts from it because people will discount me as PT Barnum and I'm just a bit of a loud mouth and I'm a spurned business partner. The truth is breaking up with Mike was the best thing that could have happened to me because now I own the launch festival and it does fantastic and it's pure to my vision. And I don't have that person in my life anymore who is a bad actor. Whether he's as bad he's as this stuff. Do you think he's going to comment, or is he just going to dig in and, and sort of like let the lawyers do the talking right now? Yeah, see, that's the other thing is, you know, his, his silence is kind of deafening. AOL's science, silence is kind of deafening. And, you know, it, if it's me and I'm accused, I'm filing lawsuits immediately to defend myself and, you know, making a quick statement. So I, I don't know. Henry, what is your take from the lack of any response from any camp? Well, I, I think that, I mean, you, you are reading something into it, and I think a lot of people probably are in that. I think uh, the other thing I would say is, is just give it time. I mean, the yeah. truth will come out here, as you've said many times. And again, I just think this is a story that you, you want to be very careful with. It's an incredibly serious allegation, as you pointed out. If it happened as described, it is a crime. You want to be careful with that. And frankly, out of respect to Mike Arrington and everybody else in this, you want to be careful with it. It's not the kind of thing you just sort of throw around. Um, and so I hope that the media is doing that. And I think that over time, Gawker's already posted a, a very detailed, careful follow up with some prior instances. Um, again, alleged, but talking about that. And my guess is we're going to see more stories on this. And then ultimately, you know, we may see a response. Yeah, I have to lay back, you know, and, and uh, we have to let this process go. And I'm not the person to sort of carry it over the finish line because, frankly, I don't have any of this information. That's the other thing that's kind of... I think that needs to be more clear, Jason. Yeah, I mean, people are starting to think that I had information. I sat on it. I Just so you know, all of these rumors I found out years after we were broken up. Years after, you know. And, you know, certainly when I read Gawker, uh, whenever the story came out, April 1st, Obviously, I didn't think it was an April Fool's joke, but I did not know any of that. Now, the Megan Asher stuff, obviously, I know some things there. And I, you know, I think it's up to Megan to make her own decision as to what she wants to talk about. I can't come out and say what somebody else told me about that situation. Right. It's secondhand. It could be made up. It could be false. Megan has to make that decision. And now this other HR person who came out, she's a professor of sociology? And she was the HR director there at Real Name. So if she, the, I, I, looking at that, that to me says this is a very credible person who has a lot to lose. By speaking out. By speaking out. And obviously Jen has a lot to lose by speaking out. Well, look what happened to Ellen Powell. Yeah. So it has to, it has to uh, take its time out. And, you know, it's like, I don't know. The whole it, and, and understand, I mean, the, the Ellen Powell point is a very important point, and I think that that is, I think it's just good to keep in mind here. That was a, an incredibly detailed, legal, specified allegation of exactly what happened. And so, again, I'm not trying to defend media and everything else, but it's a very different situation. And Ellen Powell said, look, this bad thing happened to me. I'm going to go through in excruciating detail exactly what happened. Um, and I, I would expect that if some of what has been described has happened here that you're going to see follow on like that. And, and that would certainly be the next step. Hmm. Um, and the Keith Rabboy's case, am I pronouncing his name correctly? Rabboy's? I think so. That Square. never, that didn't have any legal. He was accused. Legally? Was there a legal document? He says there isn't, I think, on Cora. So anyway. The, uh, the know, accusation I, was enough for him to... Yeah. Be forced out. Anyway, th- 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 so that's my my public position is very clear. I, this, I'm not the person to just go out there and speculate, but I do applaud um, 
you know, the, the people who are coming out, if, if they are in fact telling the truth, then I don't applaud them. I, I do think it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And right. I do think that there, there was an instance where Mike, and I, and I am on record about this, and Brooke Hammerling is on record about it. Brooke Hammerling is the highest profile PR person in the industry. Mike called her the C word. And this is when I was working with Mike. And she came to me crying. And I said, I'll handle it. I talked to Mike. And I said, you cannot, what is going on here? Were you joking? Or this is not mm -hmm. appropriate. And... He just brushed it off, and that was very much at the end of our relationship. And that was when I was like, there is something deeply mm -hmm. wrong here. Right. Because you just don't ever say that. And, and, you know, this is where I think when you are friends with somebody who's a bit of a jerk, and then you hear something like that, then you're like, okay, wait a second. This is starting to move over into a different area of this is not normal jerkdom. It's, yeah, and trust me, I'm a jerk sometimes, and I know that, and, sure, I, and, I, and I am a, I'm a full context mm -hmm. work kind of guy, and I will write things, and I'll challenge Henry on picking Larry Page versus Elon Musk and try to force him to answer it. Mm -hmm. That's all in good fun. It's all for you know, the audience, et cetera. But you know, calling her the C word to me, and I apologize to her for not standing up, that, that was where I think I, now I'm second guessing myself. I should have broken off the relationship with him at that point, which was probably a couple of months before we actually did break off the relationship. And so to Brooke, I'm hammering, I'm sorry. And I told her I'm sorry, and I've told her sorry many times, and she's forgiven me for it. Because, um, you know, you, you start to think that you can work with a person. I thought that with Mike, I was teaching him how to build his business. We were partners. We were both profiting from it. And I, and I thought, gee, I could mentor this guy. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't say this lightly like, <laughs> I don't want to use a Star Wars analogy, but, I, you know, I felt like, you know, I was teaching him how to do this. Like, I was Obi-Wan, he was Anakin Skywalker. Like, I was teaching mm -hmm. him how to have, like, accumulate power in media. I taught, I specifically had conversations with him about accumulating power in media and how being, having a conference or having a magazine and having platform. making lists right. and making a platform and then, mm -hmm. you know, how you can grow that and, and, and how that works and how the media works. And I explained all that to him and he accumulated all that power. And, of course, then he used it against me. And then, obviously, he used it in some other stories. But hit, hit, the stuff that's coming out now predates me even being involved with them, apparently. If it's true. The alleged, the alleged stuff. That's anyway. the interesting thing to me. That, like, well, I think someone was saying it's like the worst kept secret in Silicon Valley or something like that. I, I, I had not heard of it, but I've also only been covering technology for like five years. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Like, this is all new to you. as what You said this is, these sort of allegations are new to you as well in terms of uh, being surfaced yeah. yeah. Yeah, these are new. These are new. I mean, there was whisperings, you know, and I'm not talking out of school. Henry's heard the whispers. I've heard the whispers. Gawker's heard the whispers. Kara Swisher has heard the whispers for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And when a couple, I do mean like two or something like that. These rumors have been going around for two years. And of course, I didn't say anything. Henry didn't say anything. Kara didn't say anything for the right reason. You, you can't be talking about rumors about a person that are of this gravity. But when the people who are on the other side of it, who are actually impacted, talk about it, that's when we have to just sit back and let the process work. I agree with uh, Henry. And I'm assuming Henry is working on part of that process. Henry, any questions or comments to close this up? Nope. There you go. Moving on? I think we should move on. I think we should move on. What do you want to talk about? Any story but this one. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, any story but the last one. And I don't mean that in any light. I just, All right. it's, it's a very heavy story. And I just don't, I, you know, if I never see Mike Arrington again in my life, it will be too soon. All right. Literally, okay. if nobody, if, if anybody ever says the name to me, if nobody ever says Mike Arrington's name to me again, and I never read about him again, that would be my druthers. Okay. Next. On the record. Uh, so Twitter does updated cards. This is something Mike can probably talk about as well. The new cards let you see photo galleries, apps. Mike or Isaac? Mike Isaac. Oh. His okay. last name is Isaac. Oh, your last name is Isaac? And all yeah. The time I've been calling you well, Isaac. sometimes uh, people call you Calacanis, right? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. So the new Quick. cards let you see photo galleries, apps, and product listings. The bigger deal, of course, is that you can deep link to apps. So you're looking at a tweet, and you see on the card that it says, you know, open this in path, for instance. Um, the original cards launched last June. You had just more article snippets, photos, and videos. Uh, the partners in this uh, new form of the cards is uh, Path, Etsy, Flickr, Foursquare. Uh, they came out with a new iOS app and new Android app, and the mobile version is also supporting the new cards. Fred Wilson thinks this is a really big deal for e-commerce apps. Uh, Twitter saying there's already 10,000 developers, apps, and websites using cards. So is this really a big 
as big a deal as some people think it is. Okay. Mike Isaac, what do you think? Yes, sir. Uh, so I think there's two things here. One, Twitter is essentially kind of making this play to app developers that are making a case that, yes, we like Facebook or like, uh, you know, other sort of discovery mechanisms can help you build an audience can help you build uh, a way for other people to discover your application that get buried in the app store. Uh, I'm not sure if I believe that fully. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, you, you can go into a, a tweet which has a card that opens up and, and click directly from there. Uh, I don't think people are going to necessarily go to Twitter, Twitter to discover apps, but at the same time, uh, I think about the way I find apps, which often is um, word of mouth, right? And so Twitter is like word of mouth, but at scale. So I, I can see, like, incidentally, if there's a link directly to the app store that I can download an application, uh, and if someone mentions it on Twitter, maybe that's going to raise the possibility of me doing that. I think the, 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 the sort of key for developers is to make it uh, really lightweight and not super difficult for like a one or two person shop to to integrate this into a Twitter card. What do you think, um, Henry? Is this a business model, Henry? <clears throat> well, I think if they can if they can establish a beachhead for commerce, one of the biggest disappointments about Twitter has been the expectation that it would be this great commerce generator and that is just utterly flopped and it's the same for facebook in a lot of ways and so if there's a beachhead here where you, you can get people using it um that would be great news for twitter but that said i'm going to defer to mike on this just because i have not spent a lot of time looking at the product I, I think the general comment that i would make is that what twitter is increasingly trying to do is pull media and other things into itself um, and sort of become more of a media company and here become more of a commerce uh, jumping off point um, and probably just give people reasons to spend more time within it. And their ability to do that will really de determine how big and powerful a business they can become over time. Now, why didn't they launch these cards that show what app, you know, that link mm -hmm. out to the app and just say it's going to be, a, if you want to turn that on for your app, it's a penny per click. Mike, why wouldn't they just do that? Because that seems reasonable to me if you're an app developer. To pay a penny per click is a fraction of what you would pay other, you know, services to get over there. Other things. I, I mean, I think it's, I think they're not going to try, they're trying not to charge initially. It's just because they want as many people to get on board with this. Like, it, you have to, they have to make the case that you, that it's worth it to do this extra work. Right now, I'm not convinced, like, I'm personally not convinced that, you know, people are going to necessarily click through to a lot of these things. People just want to look at pictures a lot of times or maybe watch a video inside their Twitter stream. So is it worth me actually paying, you know, a penny per, I guess, I mean, I guess you could make the case that it's so small, you know, it might be worth it, but I don't know. I think, I think Henry's right, definitely, though. Twitter's been talking a long time about uh, e-commerce in terms of, Tweets will free, free float throughout the Twitter sphere, and you can click on a button and potentially buy something from inside a tweet. I think that that the closer the company gets to that, uh, the more compelling the platform gets, and the more uh, third-party developers would actually be interested in. Let's do Bitcoin. What's the Bitcoin story? All right. So Bitcoin uh, blew up within the last couple of weeks. It's become a billion-dollar market. Um, a lot of this is related to what's been happening in Cyprus and the uncertainty uh, there. The um, expense report service Expensify now lets you uh, get reimbursed in Bitcoin. Uh, Boost VC is looking for Bitcoin-related startups for its next accelerator class. There's a just under 11 million Bitcoin in circulation. Of course, this week with you know all this extra value being created, um, the Bitcoin wallet, Insta wallet was hacked and service suspended. The biggest Bitcoin exchange, Mt. Gox, was hit with a denial of service attack. There were trading delays and some people couldn't log into their accounts. So, you know, what's happening with Bitcoin? Is it really mainstream and would you invest in a Bitcoin startup? I've passed on investing in Bitcoin startups because I, I didn't think they were going to be legal because I thought mm. our government would have a really big problem with it. Right. And I think they will have a big problem with it when the first 15-year-old, sadly, dies of an OD because they bought drugs off of Silk Road with Bitcoins, or if a terrorist attack is funded, mm -hmm. God forbid, in Europe or the, God forbid, the United States as well, and somebody... Um, funded it through Bitcoin, which of course could be done with a, a brown paper bag. It would be, you know, people being people uh, die Luddites. From, right. from, from 
stuff they buy with cash. Of course. And so, but I do think that perception is reality. Sure. When people start thinking of this, how dangerous this currency is, how dangerous in quotes, because it's untraceable and virtual and uncontrollable, although it does have some controls. Henry, what do you think? Is this for real now? Well, I think, I said earlier this week, I think Bitcoin is the perfect asset bubble. And it's, it's really fun to watch, actually, because a lot of what's happening is very similar to what happened in the dot-coms in the 1990s. And basically, at its fundamental core, conceptually, the Bitcoin promise is very compelling, which is, we look, we need a global currency now. It is incredibly tedious and frictionful to have to deal with all these different currencies and everything else. You want a single currency worldwide. People who hold currency for long periods of time are incredibly frustrated by the fact that the inflation takes away the value of it. The promise of Bitcoin is there are going to be a finite number of them, and that's it. And so it will store your value and everything else. So all that is very exciting to people who look at it conceptually and understand it. Then you've got this thing where it is suddenly broken out. I hadn't paid any attention to Bitcoin despite hearing about it for a couple of years until a conference at the beginning of March where somebody at dinner said, dude, you have got to understand Bitcoin. And he explained it to me, and they were this game that you would have loved because it's like your poker where a couple of big hitters passed a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin around the table from smartphone to smartphone and back to the guy where it started, so forth. It's like, this is very exciting. At that point, Bitcoin was trading at $35. Now, here we are at 140 or wherever it is. And the higher it goes, the more people are piling in saying they're making so much money. And what I would say is, there is no way to value it. And if there really is a finite amount of it and the government doesn't make it illegal or you don't find a way to counterfeit it or hack into wallets and scare the heck out of people, there is a lot higher that the price of Bitcoin can go because how can you determine its value? What do you pay for a currency that's a finite currency with no government meddling that is increasingly accepted or all around the world? It's very exciting. So anyway, that's my view. I think it's conceptually very interesting. And we're now in the beginning stages of what I think could be a massive asset bubble. How do governments respond to it if citizens like the ones in Cyprus say, Putting money in a bank means uh, anybody at any time could take it. Putting it in bitcoins means nobody can take it at any time, unless it's a hacker, of course. But you know, it's it, it seems like for people in Cyprus, this is a better deal. Henry, hey, listen. It, I my guess is that the biggest risk to Bitcoin right now is government involvement on some sort. Yeah, there are rules about creating legal tender and the government having the power to create a currency. If Bitcoin really gets cranking and people really start to use it as a currency and they trade it and it, we have a continuation of the price moves that we've had, it wouldn't surprise me if the government took a look at it. And it's conceivable that the government could say, you know what, it's illegal to, to accept Bitcoin. And suddenly you'd have the price go from whatever gazillion level it is to zero overnight as a result of that. So I, you know, it, it, I, I think there will be government looking at it at some point if it continues to grow. Um, and I think, sir, if, you're, if you've are if got hosed in a Cyprus bank, you're looking out for pretty much anything to protect yourself. Although I should point out that most of the people who hate paper currencies, I, you know, there tends to be a lot of philosophical views in there. P paper currencies work very well for most people most of the time, and they're actually very good for economies because a little bit of inflation is good for keeping these going and keeping people wanting to spend. So I, I think the the fundamental premise right now, Bitcoin appeals very much to people who love gold and, and things like that. But again, you could see it going mainstream. Mike, do you think you're going to see this go mainstream? And do you are you aware of some of the other companies like Ripple or other ones who are trying to make similar currencies? Is this going to be the next startup wave? We're going to have 20 companies making 20 different currencies that are all finite and tweaked, uh, and, and we're going to have cross-currency, just like when you're in Vegas, you can take your Bellagio chips and at the Aria, trade them in for cash and or Aria chips, I've heard. You know, that's funny. You know, the people that I find that are the most fascinated with this are actually sort of Silicon Valley, or at least, you know, I'm, I'm in Silicon Valley, so it's sort of skewed, but uh, the engineers like love this stuff. I was talking to a Facebook engineer the other day, and they just like like the idea of uh, government-free, you know, perfect uh, currency with a limited supply. Right? They, it, it's sort of like like kind of like what uh, Henry said, and I'm mostly going to defer to him because this is this sort of ball game. But like, it's conceptually brilliant, right? It's conceptually perfect, but at the same time, there's so much 
volatility. There's so many, you know, I don't, I don't think normal people trust the, something that's non-physical and that, you know, just sort of like, okay, I, I can't pull it out of my bank account and hold it in my hand and put it in my freezer at some point, uh, you know, to the point where, uh, where we'll get to, uh, you know, the ability to, to exchange it as fully as well. I just, I just think it's sort of like a plan and, and uh, a lot of super finance and engineering wants are really the idea. I think people, uh, th this, yeah, it aligns very well with the libertarian open source movement. It's obviously an open source project. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if developers like something, they tend to use it. If they use it, it tends to become the default. And, and I think this has open source. Uh, you know, you're already seeing people start to accept it for. Uh, people are starting to accept it for coffee and stuff like that at some of the cafes in <laughs> in Silicon Valley. And so it's going to be very interesting if, for example, Square builds Bitcoin support into it. And if that happens, we're going to $1,000 a Bitcoin. So Expensify is not quite mainstream enough. No. Nobody cares about Expensify uh, supporting it. Nobody cares about that. But that being said, all you need is somebody like Facebook. And mm. Zuckerberg's very progressive. If he said, we accept Bitcoins for gifts. Ah. Oh. Ho, or Z or Pincus for Zynga oh. says you can play bitcoins in his new um, casino. Casino. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? The casino in Europe they just launched. You, you think Zynga's got a chance to come back, um, Henry Blodgett? I don't think it's worth zero, and I think that for a while there, the stock was trading as if the company was worth zero. I mean, you basically could take the cash and the value of their headquarters, and people were saying everything else is worthless. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a possibility. I think online gambling is huge. If they can figure out a way to do that and not get screwed by uh, U.S. regulators and things like that, there should be money in that. Um, so I'm not surprised to see it coming back, and my guess is there is some sort of business there. We'll see how big it can get. All right, next story. All right, so Jason, we know you're a Tesla and, fan and boy. Jason, I yep. have to say, I'm so sorry. Um, I, we're on the East Coast, and I yes. have to run home at some point soon. So, okay, last story. Um, this has been totally great. Let me do, let's do one more story. One more story. And, and then I got to run, but you guys keep talking. No, no, we're going to do one more story. All right. We're, we're at an hour, so yeah, right. One story. Jason, the Tesla fanboy, the yep. new lease program, and Tony Shea buying 100 Model S's. So, very briefly, the uh, lease program, you can, you know, banks provide 10% down for the purchase. You're going to get, depending on where you live, thousands of dollars in tax credit. After three years, you can sell the Model S back to Tesla for the same residual value percentage as a Mercedes S-Class. Now, Elon, in his video, said that the cost was about $500 a month. Some folks, of course, have come out and said that it's a lot more because Tesla is considering things like the time you spend pumping gas and what you yeah. pay for gas and things like that. Yeah. Um, Henry actually tweeted, um, uh, shorter Musk, we can't sell enough cars at 100000 so we're going to figure out a way to make them seem like they <laughs> cost less. Um, and then just a side note on Tony Shea's project in Vegas, it's a collaborative collaborative transportation system, so it's not just the 100 Teslas, it's 100 bikes, 100 bus shuttle stops yeah. and things like that, and you'd pay $400 a month for access to this great transportation system. Yeah. Um, Henry, what do you think of it? The lease system. Um, well, so let me give you my take, because listen, I know you're a huge fan of Tesla, and, and yep. I want to say that I, I just am unbelievably impressed with what Elon Musk has created. I think these are incredibly beautiful cars. They gave us one to drive around New York for a day, and it was a thrill. I mean, it's a, just a beautiful machine and very cool. Now, that said, I think that the winning environmental progressive car right now is a hybrid with both electric drive and gas drive and that most electric cars right now are basically play toys for people who can afford to have a hundred thousand dollar third or fourth car and i know that tesla down the road is planning to come out with a really cheap car that everybody can buy nissan has already come out with one with leaf you know, it just hasn't been that big a hit. And part of that's because gas, people are, are willing to tolerate gas at $5 a gallon. So I think that all electric cars right now are ahead of their time. And um, I don't, I, I think that's the issue. And, and my guess is this new leasing is, as I said, it's a way of just making the car less expensive than, than a $100,000 ticket would be. Yeah, it, I, I understand what Elon's doing here. Like, so I haven't gone to a gas station. I will say the Model S is my primary car yep. because it goes 250 miles. I don't have any drives that I do that are more than that, except for an occasional road trip. And we do have a car that's a gas car. We have a SUV that we can take on that. And that literally is once a year. So we're actually getting rid of that and getting a second Model S. So we'll be 100% electric. 
Wow. The Roadster and two Model S's wow. um, in about three or four wow. months. So we, if our plan is if we need to rent a car, if we need a car that needs to go over whatever number of miles and there's not a supercharger station, and we're in California, so the supercharging station is anywhere, we're just going to rent one. Hmm. And we don't foresee that happening because the only place we drive is L.A., Vegas, and San Diego. All those have superchargers, so we're done. Um, so I disagree with Henry there. Like, you, if you live in California, actually, the supercharging stations make it viable as a primary car. But this was a mistake, I think. Um, the optics of it. Well, there, there's a couple of mistakes in it that, like, the business tax benefit is by default on. I would have that on off by default. And <laughs> yeah, if, can I ask you? I, I felt like I saw that. I mean, first of all, I thought some of the assumptions in the $500 thing was just ridiculous. And I, I got to say, people gave Steve Jobs a lot of guff for the reality distortion field. Elon Musk takes the cake. I mean, this is reality <laughs> distortion on a level even Steve Jobs couldn't have. Well, I do think imagined. you avoid the gas but station. Here's my design. question for you, though. I, it's like when I read that, it's like deducted as a business expense. I mean, like, am I the only guy in America who doesn't deduct his car as a business expense? Yeah, I, you know, I, don't. I take calls in my car sometimes. Does that mean it should be a work expense? I don't know. I don't know exactly what the thinking is there. I do agree with the avoid the gas station, though, because I literally don't go to gas stations anymore. And oh my God, is that one of the great benefits of like you save that 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or whatever, or just sure. having to go out of your way to go to a gas station, or even remembering it. It's just so delightful. And, you know, we're going to have gas at 6 or 7 or $8 in the next, whatever, 5 to 10 years. That's cool. It already is in Europe. Yeah, and so it's going to come, it's going to go up. <laughs> and so this, and, and the price of the car is going to go down. So I felt like he was trying really hard to try to educate people, and maybe he missed the mark here. Um, but, of course, I'm a fanboy, so I'm not. What do you think, Mike? You're seeing them all over. You're seeing Teslas every. I was at Google yesterday and YouTube yesterday. Yeah. There's, like, I see, like, I don't I think Google and YouTube and Facebook, and, and certainly on Sand Hill Road, you see so many Model S's. It's unbelievable. It's like the Toyota Prius yeah. of Sand Hill Road. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, Sergey Brin has a pink one with chrome rims now, apparently. So that was that's genius. Did you, did you see that? I did. I did. That was an April Fool's joke, apparently. Yeah, that, that one on the ticker. Like the April yeah. Fool joke. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I'm not super into it either. I think like I, I, I kind of like Henry said. Like we're way far off. Uh, uh, these things are sort of way ahead of their time. But at the same time, like you know, pro boosters like you, Elon, you need these sort of uh, people to to jumpstart the market to actually get this sort of thing going if you want it to uh, to be a viable option in the future. I'm not going to buy one, but uh, maybe. Maybe people get sort of interested in this this plan and people put it forth. Yeah, I mean the way I look at it is the market is went from it went from a hundred and forty thousand dollar car to a seventy thousand dollar car. You can get into it reasonably for seventy thousand. So we went from one hundred thirty forty for the roadster to seventy. It'll come down to fifty percent, and the leaf is like forty. Yeah. So I mean I think he's in shooting distance. Uh, oh, and yeah, it's maybe seventy or eighty with a ten k tax credit depending on the state. So I mean he's getting in shooting distance, and I think it's going to all work itself out. Um, so I, yeah, I felt like this was a little aggressive. I, Henry felt this a lot aggressive. But hey, let me thank Henry Blasier for being on the program. Everybody, check out Business Insider and the New. York Yorker, where Henry Blodgett say, finally got his here? New Yorker profile. Oh, was it here? That's my no, copy. Yeah, oh, yeah. Finally. That was quite the, was quite the humble the brag there. <laughs> finally, Henry gets his thing. Quite the humble the brag. Very, anyway. The very first who, 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 oh, Ken, and you got Ken Oletta treatment. Whoa. I got, Mar Lar you got Larissa McFarquhar. I got Larissa McFarquhar, but that's a, I need to get a follow-up on mine. I need to do something interesting. But uh, hey, how does it feel to have the New Yorker there it is, profile, there it is. Henry? You, you just... There you go. How does it feel? Well, I've been I've been studiously avoiding it. I don't know about you, but I it's you a lying. Whole survival tactic. No, I have I have <laughs> that, I mean I look, people are telling me it's okay. I'm not gonna be depressed or angry. I should just go read it and I probably will. But you haven't read it? No, he hasn't. He told no, before the show. It. Listen, let me explain something to you. Nobody reads it. Nobody reads. Like five people read it. The rest I of the people it. skim it, they read the first two paragraphs. The fact is, you're anointed now. Ken O'Leary profiled you, Henry. And, uh, I'm you, happy about that. It was an honor to be written about by him. It's a big deal. It's a BFD, as we say, in the business. And what's this uh, nonsense about you want to get reinstated on the Wall Street? Is, is that true you said uh -huh. that? Uh, well, look, I mean, uh, the way I would describe it is I feel like I got what amounts to a dishonorable discharge. And I am, frankly, ashamed of that. I don't like that status. And I would like to possibly at some point, if it's ever appropriate, just see if I can reapply to the industry. And I don't know whether I'll do that. I am incredibly happy with what I'm doing. It's not that I want to go work on Wall Street again. Uh, but I, you know, as a possibility, that would be that would be interesting. What do you think 
is there a penance that you should uh, that what would get people to over that hurdle? Like if you did something, or do you feel just your work has been so good over the last couple of years that would would warrant it? I don't know. I, I mean, when I entered the agreement where I was effectively kicked out of the industry permanently, I did actually ask some attorneys at that point. I said, look, are these, you know, are these things ever undone? Is there a way back in? And, and the feedback I got at that point was 10 years, you know, go, go live a good life and, and do things and you, you can revisit it. And there's always a right to reapply. You can, you can try that at any time. Yeah. And um, I think but, the Elliot, so that, yeah, go ahead. So anyway, so so I, I don't know, honestly, and I don't know what the reaction would be. And obviously, my case was a very high profile case. Um, so it, it, I don't know is the answer. But if, if the opportunity is there and it seems appropriate, it would be something that I feel like just personally I, I would like. Well, listen, I, I, I wish you the best. I know you're a great guy. And uh, thank you for being on the program and continued success with Business Insider. And everybody follow H. Blodgett, at H. Blodgett, B-L-O-D-G-E-T, on Twitter. Thanks for being on the program. You're very kind. Thank you for having me. Hey, and uh, Mike Isaac, thank you so much for being on the program. Everybody follow Mike Isaac on uh, Twitter, I-S-A-A-C. M Mike Isaac. That's what I said, Mike Isaac. M at Mike Isaac. At oh. Mike Isaac, yeah. <laughs> at Mike Isaac. Yeah. Okay. At Isaac. And my... <laughs> <laughs> my my Twitter, my uh, New Yorker profile will be coming out in 2014, by the way. Oh, 2014. Oh, you're next up? Ken Olet is uh, yeah. knocking on the door right now. And uh, right. if you want to read the best uh, social news and also uh, pound for pound, um, perhaps the best publication. Eh, I'd say it's probably, yeah, it's pound for pound the best publication in tech right now. I mean, it's Wired. Yeah. And All Things D would be neck and neck, I would say. Well, Mike used to work for Wired. Oh, okay. So I was at Wired before All Things D. Yeah. So, and listen, pound for pound, I say those are the two best publications, best best journalistic teams. I say Pando's up and coming. Business Insider is a business one, so they don't count in that list. But, uh, hey, everybody check out at All Things D as well, allthingsd.com and the D Conference. And they do dive into mobile now, too, which is an That's excellent right. event. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks or months in the uh, at the D Conference, um, Mike. Yeah, I will say hi in person. Thanks so Great. much for we'll, having me. We'll play high card. Uh, thanks for being on the program. Uh, that was an interesting episode. And you have to thank your sponsors. Ah, uh, yes. And thank you to the resonator. And thank you to my, my turnstone. Turn did my I do turn okay sound. on the my guarantee? Did I, do okay? I think you did. Is it okay? I think it was okay. Yeah. Do you want to close the show? Yeah, we'll close the show. We'll see everybody next time on This Week in Startups.